Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Oxford Martin School for our fifth seminar on our health and the 21st century uh, series. We've got uh, two speakers today, uh, Professor Terry Dwyer and Dr. Kazem Rahimi. Um, I'll introduce both and then they will speak consecutively. Um, so Terry is a, a new arrival in Oxford. He's Professor of Epidemiology here and he's the Executive Director of the George Institute for Global Health at the Oxford Martin School. Uh, over his career, he's had a major involvement in the effects of exposures in early life on later disease. Um, his team's research on sudden infant death syndrome uh, was recognised by the National <coughs> Health and Medical Research Council of his native Australia as one of the most important contributions to medical research by Australia in the 20th century. Uh, his current work focuses on the joint effects of genes and environment in diseases as diverse as cancer, cardiovascular disease and multiple sclerosis, and his efforts are now concentrated on two major global cohort collaborations, both of which he leads. And just to give you a sense of the scope and ambition of these, one of them, the International Childhood Cancer Cohort Consortium, in order to better understand potential causes of childhood cancer, intends to pool data from a million mothers and babies to provide the necessary power to examine exposure disease associations, and it's already compiled data on about 400,000 subjects. Um, so we'll hear first from Terry, and then we're going to hear from um, Kazem, Dr. Kazem Rahimi. He is Deputy Director of the George Institute for Global Health at the Oxford Martin School. He's also James Martin Senior Fellow in Essential Healthcare here at the University, and an Honorary Consultant Cardiologist at the JR. Kazem leads the Essential Healthcare Program, uh, which aims to find practical and affordable solutions for the global health priorities of the world's largest emerging economies, but also works on the disadvantaged uh, people in um, developed economies, established economies. His research interests include service delivery innovation in chronic disease prevention and management, large-scale complex intervention studies, and data-driven electronic decision support systems. And he's currently chief investigator of a number of large-scale projects and programs. Just to give you two examples, one is a trial of remote self-management support in patients with heart failure, and another, another an international collaboration of blood pressure lowering trialists. So that gives you an idea of the variety of topics we might hear about. And each will speak for 20 odd minutes, 20, 25 minutes, and then will join me here at the front for uh, questions and answers. So after Terry's talk, if you can hold on to your questions until the end, that would be great. So over to Terry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian, and thank you to the Martin School for giving us, uh, Kazem and I, the opportunity to present some key work that is being conducted at the... Uh, at the George Institute and uh, a relatively new institute here in Oxford which is part of the Martin, Oxford Martin School and also affiliated with the Nuffield Department of Population Health. We've chosen a topic today that we thought would allow us both to, to fit within it. As you'll see our work is, uh, is a little disparate although our focus today is at least on the same disease. These are World Health Organization figures on the leading causes of mortality in the world. Ischemic heart disease, which we are going to focus on today, is the most common cause of death. And uh, that's true for both the developed and developing world. Uh, the, the death rate has been falling in the developed world quite substantially from about the late, late 60s in the first countries where we saw the decline, Australia and the US, the UK came about, ten, decline came about 10 years later. But it remains the, still the, the leading or second leading cause of, cause of death uh, in uh, countries in the developed world. And in the developing world, it's on the rise and it's, uh, it's a very substantial and leading cause of death there. So we're going to talk about this disease, which we've made progress on in one part of the world. We know quite a bit about, but there are still some significant gaps. Uh, in Kazem's case, he's going to talk about the end of life where people have contracted the disease and what can we do for them. I'm going to talk about the very early part of life and what we might do there to prevent this disease. So here, uh, this is the, the pathology that underpins ischemic heart disease. I expect most of you will, will know this. This is a, a coronary artery which is being blocked by uh, what we call a plaque, an atherosclerotic plaque, which is, has in its, where the disease part is, it has fibrous tissue and 
cholesterol, other entities. And this, uh, what we see here, is what might be in place by middle to later age. But we also know that coronary, this atherosclerotic process, while it reaches a point where it can cause evident disease late in life, it actually starts in very, very early life. In fact, if you cut open the arteries, particularly the, the main artery in the body, the, the aorta of a child of five to 10, a proportion of them will, will already have fatty streaks under the surface of the artery that are uh, basically an accumulation of cholesterol. And by the age of about 20, and the, these estimates come from things like autopsies of soldiers who died in the war. Uh, one of the studies was in the Vietnam War on US soldiers who died. About 20% of them had visible plaque, not like the, the one we saw in the previous slide, but enough to show a, an elevation and the, the, the disease process was well underway. And we know that um, we know that risk factor lowering in adulthood is effective in prevention. Um, what sort of risk factors? Well, um, cholesterol, which is part of the plaque, if uh, dietary fat is lowered or if we use drugs that lower cholesterol in the, in the blood, particularly these days statins. If we lower blood pressure, blood pressure damages the arteries and allows uh, substances like cholesterol into the arteries to cause the damage. Smoking damages the arterial wall. All those things we know increase risk. And we know if we, uh, if we intervene to lower those risk factors in adulthood that it's effective. We can reduce risk quite substantially. In fact, if we do reduce cholesterol at say age 40 or 50, by 1%, we can reduce uh, incidence and mortality by about 3% 3, 3 so if you had a 10% lowering of cholesterol you'd reduce your risk by about a third so that's very substantial but even though the disease we know the disease is starting uh, very early and it makes sense that uh, lowering risk factors even earlier than 30 or 40 maybe 5 or 10 would get an even bigger effect we don't have any direct evidence to show that and it's one of the reasons why in terms of public policy that the efforts to improve health uh, through measures in interventions in lifestyle or even using drugs in childhood are not really very popular yet. People talk about it, governments talk about it, doctors, health educators do, but it's, there's not really a lot of force be behind the, the policy. And uh, a major reason is because when the committees sit down to discuss it at national level, someone will quite reasonably say, well, we don't have any direct effort evidence that if we change risk factors at age 10, it would do more than changing them at age 40. Now, uh, why don't we have such evidence? Well, part of the problem is the types of studies that are needed. It's, not, it's really not the type of evidence you could get from a study on rabbits or mice. It needs human evidence. And it needs it, really it needs it over a long period of time, over a lifetime. Uh, this, uh, this excludes the best design we have to test hypotheses of that kind randomised trials, you can imagine uh, maybe going into a school system and contacting parents and saying, look, would you mind entering a randomised trial, entering your child into a randomised trial for the next 30 years? Um, if you're in one arm, we'll lower your child's blood pressure and cholesterol if it's high. If, uh, if you're not in that arm, uh, we will watch for 30 years to see whether your child does better or worse. Now, that sort of study wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be supported by the, the subjects and actually the cost of doing something like that would be so high that I think the scientific community would, would resist the, the, um, the suggestion that it, it be funded. So what do we do? How can we actually, um, how can we, fund, how can we conduct, collect the data and does it, does it matter? Well, it, 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 it potentially matters because we're dealing with a very common disease and we're dealing with a disease where we know, know it is possible to prevent it. And if there was a, a greater effect, a substantially greater effect of lowering risk factors in childhood, it would be important. And we also have going on in parallel, I, I put this up, this is, a, this is actually a slide from, uh, from modern Asia, because we've got these changes going on with children. It's, uh, I know watching uh, children in my family that what they eat now is quite different. The, the access to foods is different to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and obesity is becoming a, a, real, a, a real issue around the world. I first went to Vietnam to have a look at cardiovascular disease rates there. 
to the World Health Organization in 1997. And I remember part of the visit took me to, um, to a primary school. It's a nice experience. Uh, children sang songs for me and uh, they made me sing a song for them, which I won't do for you today. But they, uh, the two, there was one fat boy of about 10 years of age and I said to the young teacher, oh, you have fat children here? And she said, oh, here's the first one. We have not had a fat child here before. But if I went back now, 17 years later, I'm sure there would be many. So things are changing for children and not all in the, the um, what would appear to be the, the most healthy direction, although we don't know whether if a child grows up like this, whether if they started to reduce their risk factors at age 40, whether all that could be achieved could be achieved then. So that's the, the issue. How can, we get, how can we get evidence? Well, really what we need, and this is the only sort of evidence that, that would be obtainable, is to be able to get evidence from prospective cohort studies where we have measurements of risk factors in children uh, and measurements over time, measurements of risk factors in adulthood, and be able to compare the risk associated with the risk factor levels in childhood for ischemic heart disease and the risk in adulthood and see whether the risk levels are different and how different they are. And we would also at the same time, as including all the risk factors of interest so that we can actually separate the effects of the different risk factors. Uh, sorry. We would also like studies that had those sorts of measures over time. And again, it would be very difficult to start such a study. If we here uh, in the Nuffield Department of Population Health were to put in an application for a 50-year study, uh, to answer this question, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we have to take advantage of work that's in progress, and that's what I have been doing. One of the studies I was involved in in 1985 was of 8,000 Australian school children uh, who, well, it's almost 2015, a month or two away, who now are between 37 and 45, and we have measurements on them at those, those school ages and again, uh, intermediate measures in their 20s. But it's not the only study uh, that has such measures. And I became aware when I started to think about this around about 2000, started thinking to apply for funding to follow the, the, um, follow the subjects we had, I realised that with 8,000 subjects, it would take us quite a long while to accumulate the data we needed. But if we could get other, if we could increase the numbers, we'd do it faster. And we were able to identify back in 2002 that there were other studies, not as many as I had thought originally, but six other studies. One in Finland uh, with 3,000 subjects. You can see this maps sort of highlighting these things. Uh, and there were also studies in the, in the United States, in fact, five of them. And together, we had 40,000 subjects with measurements in childhood, measurements in early adulthood of risk factors, and who had been followed, in our case, in Australia for 30 years, but in some of the other studies for up to 45 years, all with good measures. So I travelled uh, and travelled with colleagues, and we, we talked about doing this study, um, and there was quite a lot of enthusiasm from the, the group, uh, fortunately. So we then started to talk about how to harmonise our variables what questions we would address, when we'd be able to look at uh, ischemic heart disease events, how long it would take us to have enough numbers to look. And um, I might just say, because I think it's interesting, that these long-term studies, um, you, you have people of my vintage involved in them who've been involved from a much earlier age, but this fellow here, who's, our, who's in head of the, the biggest of the American studies and started his study planning in the late 1960s. I went to his 92nd birthday uh, last year. Uh, he's well, and his 98-year-old sister was there, and she, she was equally well. So people have to be in it for a long time to do this sort of work. Uh, as well as looking at how we could bring together all the data we already had on risk factors in both childhood and, uh, and adulthood, we added some measures. One of them was a measure of the, using a, an ultrasound and measuring the carotid artery where plaque also builds up, just like in the coronary arteries, and it can give us a, an a, idea of whether the atherosclerotic process uh, is uh, 
advanced uh, beyond normal in an individual. And so we did, we did do this measure across the studies as an intermediate measure of uh, progress of the disease. Um, this uh, consortium, which as I said started in 2002, took six years to have a publication uh, which occurred in, the, in circulation. It was actually about children with high cholesterol level and, and what happened to their cholesterols over time. If one was to institute a screening program for children and choose a cutoff point and then say, well, we'll treat these ones, uh, what, what would have happened over time? Would, they, would their cholesterols have stayed high if we'd done nothing or would they have uh, remained high? And that, the first publication we had was on that topic in, uh, in, the, pretty, in, in the reasonably influential uh, cardiovascular disease journal circulation. In 2011, we had a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, our, the Finnish team uh, led that. And I'm going to show you the results of it as the only results from this consortium that uh, I will show today in uh, a modestly short talk. Um, and this was led by a, a fellow called Marcus Uanola from, uh, from Turku in Finland, which is where their team is based and where the data coordinating centre is. He's now actually spending time at one of the other, one of the other studies in Australia. And this is, I'm going to have to tell you what it is, I think. I did think of redoing these at 2 o'clock this afternoon, but realised it wasn't possible. What we've got here, what we did in this New England Journal of Medicine article is we addressed the question, if a child is fat but becomes normal weight, fat as a child, normal weight as an adult, or if they're normal weight as a child and become fat, what are the consequences of that? Is a, a child who is fat and becomes thin worse off than a child who was thin and still thin as an adult, or as a child who's normal weight and becomes overweight as an adult, how, what's their risk uh, of certain outcomes, and the outcomes we looked at were, in this case, whether they developed diabetes, whether their LDL cholesterol was high, whether their blood pressure was high, and whether the, the carotid, the thickening in the carotid was, was normal or not. And what we found in the data that we analysed that went into the New England Journal of Medicine, and at least the colours are the same. So once I explain it to you, you will uh, you will know which is which. That so uh, this down here, this one here, are the group who were overweight as children or obese and became normal weight as as adults. These are the ones who were normal weight as children and normal weight. These ones here were overweight as children and obese as adults. These ones here were normal weight as children and obese as adults. And for all of these four panels, for those outcomes, it's the major difference you can see is that those who are normal weight in adulthood were... Thank you, Clara. Sorry. Um, well, let me say it again. So these are the overweight as children, normal as adults, normal at both points, uh, overweight and obese at both childhood and adulthood, and these are the normal in childhood and obese as adults. And the, the major impact that we see is in their status in adulthood. So if, if, this, if this applies totally, then uh, what we'll be able to say is it doesn't matter. You can, the child, well, this, is a, this is a bit beyond what one might say, but the broad, the broad statement would be it's really the adulthood status that matters in terms of these risk factors. However, we're not looking here at cardiovascular disease events like ischemic heart disease, and uh, it really won't be until we collect data on those events that we know just what... Um, uh, the effect of the different status at different stages has on the risk of the events themselves. And this is where we're up to. And this is my last, last slide. Um, we're at a stage now where we estimate, we haven't actually followed the subjects to this point to, to ascertain these events, but we will shortly, that there will have been about 2,000 total cardiovascular disease events, about a third will be strokes, about two thirds will be ischemic heart disease. Uh, and there will be 
about 2,000 cases of diabetes. This is in the 40,000 we started with. And there'll probably, there'll be about um, 207 cardiovascular disease deaths and about 1,000 total deaths. Uh, four or five months ago, we received a grant from the National Institutes of Health to follow the subjects for these outcomes, which means going back to the subjects, asking them and their families what's happened to them, searching the death records, uh, getting permission to, to uh, extract their hospital records, approach their doctors and get as much information as we can on what's happened to them so that we can actually, as completely as possible, uh, uh, ascertain uh, these outcomes and then try to link them to those other two data sets, that is the childhood risk factor data, lifestyle data and also the early adult data. Uh, and we should have an answer to the question in five years time. So during this next period while I'm here we'll be, uh, we'll be supervising the collection of the data from around the world and then analysing it analysing it and uh, uh, to, find, to, to finish uh, we will all also because we've got all that data follow them for other important causes of, of <coughs> disease and, and death uh, after we have looked at cardiovascular disease. So I'll stop there and hand over to Kazem Rahimi. Uh, so step down, just make sure you've got, can you, I'll let you do it. Welcome everybody. So I'm going to shift gear and move from childhood to middle age and old age. Uh, as Terry said earlier, the focus is very much on the same disease, but the emphasis is not so much on finding what causes illness, because by the age, when we reach that age, many of us would have been exposed to those risk factors. In fact, many of us would have suffered um, cardiovascular diseases, diseases of the heart and uh, stroke. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is uh, provide some examples of how can we help um, to better manage uh, disease and help to prevent it uh, in those age groups. Before providing a couple of examples of the work that we are doing and uh, leading into discussion, uh, let me just present a few facts. Uh, I mean, if we look at the uh, age distribution across the world, this is just looking at England. Uh, up until a few centuries ago, um, average was in the range of 30 to 40 years old. But it started to increase rapidly more recently. And it's not just only in high-income countries. So in high-income countries, it's quite common and that we age up to 80 years and more. But even in low-income and middle countries, where we started a bit slower, uh, even in those countries, uh, the average age is increasing rapidly. So the question that many are posing is, now that we have added years to our lives, how can we make sure and that we also add quality to it? Um, how can we make sure that uh, we live an active life um, until our old age? So if we look at the, the current status, um, still diseases of heart and uh, brain, cardiovascular diseases, are the biggest killer worldwide and the biggest cause of disability. Uh, if you look at the latest estimates um, in 2010, one quarter of all death worldwide are due to stroke and ischemic heart disease. That is 13 million deaths uh, in 2010. And this is despite the fact uh, that we have developed quite significant uh, proven strategies on how to prevent um, and manage these conditions. And the striking feature is not only is it still the biggest killer, that it tends to affect the poorest and the disadvantaged people more. If you look at in any country, even within the same neighborhood, uh, there is dramatic difference in terms of presentation of those who are disadvantaged and those who are richer. Uh, I mean, those, the less affluent people are likely to present about five to ten years earlier with a heart attack um, than the citizens that do not differ. Uh, at least when we look at it in terms of the geographic region other than um, a few other uh, common risk factors. And as I said earlier, we know that today with the scientific evidence that we've accumulated, there's just applying a few drugs 
uh, a few tablets can half the risk of a suffering heart attack and stroke. Uh, but in many systems in, in the world, we are far away from reaching those targets. And the question that begs is, and this is what drives our research, how can we make sure that we get closer to that target? How can we make sure that effective therapies um, that are existing today and those that are gonna come in the future are implemented effectively at low cost, but also at the same time at the highest quality? This is not to compromise cost with quality, but trying to reach both targets. One area that has received a lot of attention is technology, in particular digital technology. It has transformed the life in many domains, but in healthcare, we are not yet there. Um, so the idea is, can we use digital technologies um, to make sure that healthcare is more effective, efficient? Let me just explain what we mean by digital health, and in this context, integrated digital health is not you know, having our iPhone that we can use and uh, watch our running in the morning. That is not uh, digital health. It is part of it. Having those sensors is part of it. But the real power of digital health is the computing power, mobile network internet, to be able to converge the information that we're able to collect, the data that we're able to collect from health records, genomics, imaging, and so on, to make sense of it to translate those uh, raw data into information and ultimately to actionable uh, inform data that can lead into what some people ambitiously call the next healthcare revolution that allows us to improve the way we diagnose conditions, having richer data, be able to uh, predict who is likely to deteriorate in a much more stratified way than we have been able to do it before. Um, with that information, prevent and manage conditions not only on average, um, looking at what an intervention does to hundred thousands of people, but increasingly we are interested to look at smaller groups of people. How can an intervention affect me or people similar to me uh, compared to the wider population? And this is the promise of digital health, uh, data collected about us, about our behavior um, over time. And the idea is by using technology, um, we can replace some of the labor-intensive components of our work, and by doing this, we can make healthcare more accessible and more affordable. So this is the promise of um, integrated digital health. The industry clearly has got a lot of uh, faith in it. If one looks at the investment that has occurred recently, this is just one esti estimate from the US, over two billion venture capital investment has gone into digital health uh, companies. Um, and it's predicted that that investment in 2014 will surpass the traditional investment that has been made in the medical devices industry. And these are things like you know, ECG devices and so on, ICDs. So it's a huge investment. Um, but we haven't seen much of it in terms of impact um, on uh, aging populations and management of chronic diseases. And this is probably something that we all know. And I uh, just quote Bill Gates, IT will make an efficient business more efficient it will make an inefficient business more inefficient. It is just because it's not about the technology on its own. We need to understand how the system works and be able to integrate it into the system in a way that can help us to solve the problem. Where does technology fit into this? Let me just briefly take you through this chart. If we look at any task that we want to manage, um, we can divide the task here on the y-axis by the level of difficulty of the task from low to very high. Um, and we can look at the level of the training of the people or the group of people who are meant to tackle that task here on the x-axis from low to the high. Where we want to ideally be is in that green zone. We want to have a perfect match between the level of the skills that someone is asked to develop a task and the complexity of the task. If this is not the case, if, we, if you're in that zone, where we ask highly skilled people to do low skilled work, the care becomes simply inefficient, or at the minimum it becomes inefficient. And if you're at the other end of the spectrum, where we have low skilled workers, and we ask them to perform tasks that for the level of their training are too complex, the care becomes inefficient or unsafe. And technology, in my view, can help at both ends. The low hanging fruit is here. You know, the simple tasks, that is where technology computers are good at. Repetition. You know, things like drug titration, there doesn't need to be any, we don't need to have doctors trained for many years or nurses to just tell us, apply the certain rules that we have learned, who needs to be taking what when. 
That is fairly straightforward. Education, from patient's perspective, it is a unique request. If you see a doctor and ask what's gonna happen to you and you have been diagnosed with something, uh, can you travel with that condition? Is, you, know, you ask it probably once because you have been just told that this is your diagnosis. But from a physician's perspective, it is incredibly repetitive. You keep asking, answering the same questions and so on. And we are not good at it. Um, this is where technology can help. So doing the repetition through standard, standardization and automation. And at the other end, um, technology can help as well. This is the wealth of gen data that is coming that I said earlier is impossible for anyone uh, even the smartest healthcare professionals, to be able to process that information in a way that they can make sense of it, to make diagnosis, predict who's going to deteriorate, and so on. This is where the computing power comes in. And with those principles, we have been working on a few projects, um, and I'm just going to provide a few examples of that. The first one is what we call Support CVD, is, the, is a big project, uh, the world's largest community-based uh, uh, project using IT uh, supported um, systems for management of cardiovascular disease in middle age. The study is um, to start soon, and the principle here is that we use community healthcare workers with a few years of education, formal education, and we empower them to make decisions that in many other healthcare systems highly skilled um, doctors would be doing. This is a combination of using point of care diagnostic affordable devices that we have combine it with electronic decision supports, drugs that are affordably available, uh, a pill that can half the risk, of, risk of, of cardiovascular diseases and only costs five pounds per year per person. I mean, this is available and to make it accessible to a wide range of people. And as said, empowering these non-physician healthcare workers not only about how they make decisions, but how do they perform, provide feedback, analyze the behavior, um, encourage them to do more um, and have the necessary scale. As uh, Terry said earlier, many of these studies, we would not be able to find a definitive answer if we just look at small examples. Um, and this is, you know, we'd be able to recruit over 50,000 people aged 40 and more. We would be able to provide a definitive answer whether that combination of technology and training of healthcare workers with affordable uh, solutions can provide a platform of delivering healthcare and this is an example for cardiovascular risk prediction, but this is a model that could be applied to many other conditions um, across the world. So this will take a few years to complete. Um, and, uh, but let me just, uh, and, and this is just sort of a prototype of the devices of how it works. It's really simple. Uh, you know, we can ask uh, patients uh, history, general information, what medication they're taking, what treatment, and have a computer to estimate what people's risk is, and use it as a platform to communicate to the patients directly so that they can understand what is the implications of the decisions um, so that the shared decision making genuinely can be taking place so they, they can visually see what it would mean for them to stop smoking, what it, it would mean for them to stop, start taking a, a um, tablet for life. So the second example that I want to bring just moving beyond um, from healthcare workers to patients. Any healthcare system that we look at, still we as patients are the biggest healthcare force that you can see. Whether we accept it or not, the majority of the work that is done in healthcare is by lay people. At the moment, the, the challenge that we have is that a lot of it is, is unstructured. Uh, we go to Wikipedia before we see a doctor. By the way, doctors do the same, so it must not be a bad source. Uh, and I do it occasionally, so it's not a bad thing necessarily, but how can we empower people, and in particular elderly people, um, to, do, to make the right decision and to be involved in that? The condition um, that uh, we are focusing on here is uh, a condition that we call heart failure. Wow, the video clips are working here, a bit, uh, makes you a bit dizzy, so I'm just gonna move on. Um, but it's a condition is heart failure. It doesn't mean that the heart is failing, what it means that you know, the heart is not strong enough uh, to pump the blood into circulation. And one of the striking features of heart failure is if you look at here at the, from the quote from one of the patients, one day I'll be on top, of, on top the next day back on the again, it is a fluctuation that we see in a hypothetical cause of a patient's life. Being diagnosed, the quality of life drops because you're in hospital and you may be well for some time and you don't know when, but it's gonna hit you again 
if you are lucky, because sometimes if you're unlucky, you may have a suffer a sudden cardiac death without any warning. So it's very hard to just know at any point in time where you are. And if you could contrast it with the situation that we have, and this is, does not apply to low and middle income countries, this is the situation that we have here. What is the current model of exchanging information from a patient who has been just told bad luck, you have been uh, diagnosed with heart failure, what is the solution that, uh, model that he sees of communicating his needs and questions with the healthcare professionals? H stands for hospital. The patient comes to hospital, spends a few days in hospitals, discharge, is being diagnosed. And the way it looks like for patients is after your hospital admission, typically a long time will go, day by day, just trying to look at it from patient's perspective, where you're on your own, without any exposure to health services. You may be lucky, you may be able to see the patient two uh, doctor two weeks later, and then six months, nothing. But on average, statistics tell us 99% of the time, patients will spend on their own with no exposure to health services. That on its own is not necessarily a bad thing. We've got plenty of studies showing that a lot of patients do well. In fact, many of them do better if they don't see doctors. Uh, coming to hospitals can lead to you know, overdiagnosis and you know, malpractice and so on, and can cause harm at the end. So we need to be careful. I'm not implying that the, the more the better, but it is, is a blind spot here. So we don't know what is happening to the patient during that time. And this is, the hope is that technology can cover that blind stop, spot. Industry has spent a lot of money on this. We've got a lot of smart sensors that collect information about our behavior. And if you look at a Silicon Valley brochure, that is you know, the picture that you get. You, know, you can monitor your sleep pattern, physical activity, and all sort of different things. But if I put my clinician hand, Oxford John Radcliffe Hospital level seven where medical admissions being admitted, this is a sort of a picture that we get. These are the patients in need. And I can't really imagine how they can be sort of be strapped you know, and monitored with the self-quantification on a daily basis and manage the, the, the health condition. So you know, not all of those solutions are ready for those patients in need um, at the moment. Even if they were willing and able to do that, the second problem that a lot of the time those technology solutions offer is that they're not connected to the healthcare system, not connected to the patient's doctors, not connected where the rest of the information sits in, in health records and so on. We have been trying to tackle that in a study that we call Support HF, and what we did saying, well, let's start with the patients. What do they like? What can they do uh, with a workshop? Offer them different solutions. Um, and by doing that, we try to at the same time connect it to the, to the uh, healthcare system and get live data, and they would be able to do that. They did a weight monitoring and blood pressure monitoring and told us how they felt. This is how the data came back on the back, back end server to us. In order to learn from the behavior, we did a quite intensive multi-source um, study of observing the behavior in the home environment, tracking the behavior through any tap that they did on the tablet PC and iteratively changed the, changed the design of the study over time. And these are sort of some findings from the study, fairly small, but big enough for us to understand what people can do. Age range, median age of 77, that is typical for people with heart failure in this country. Uh, range 21 to 94, as you would expect, about half of these people told us that they have never used digital te technologies. They have never used a touch screen, iPad, smartphone that we all cannot live with anymore. Um, but you know, after six months, when we asked them how they felt, how they could use the technology, this is the sort of responses that they gave us. Um, whilst the learning curve was different, depending on where you started from, the majority of them said that they found the system easy to use. 63% said I strongly agree, 30% I agree to that. If available as part of routine care, I would use it, almost all of them. Um, agreed to that. I would recommend the system to others, 100% agreed or strongly agreed to that. You could argue, you know, this is question, you know, the questionnaire survey, they could be biased. But it was interesting to find out when we went to just retrieve the devices at the end of the study for, from them, a third wanted to keep it because they felt that they're getting something out of it. And this is despite the fact that we just want to learn from them. We didn't provide any medical information at all. But the just sense of being connected was so reassuring that they just want to continue with that. We also track the behavior. We could by second or by millisecond measure um, how long they have used the system for. 
And if you look at it over time on average, um, they started, they used the system at the beginning and we just allowed them to do as, as frequently as they wanted to use it. Um, you know, six days per week and it just dropped to 4.5 days, but it's still very strong adherence in, in, during the course of the study. But what they also told us is that is good, but it could be better. You know, I want it to be more personalized for me. And taking those, learning those lessons uh, we are working on the next phase of this study. We feel that we have sort of managed to connect with the patients and the caregivers. The first step, um, the critical step that is a lot of the time forgotten or comes sort of as an afterthought. Uh, we have been working hard to, to get uh, patients' data from the healthcare systems and connecting with the professionals much harder than you would think with the sensitivity in uh, data in, uh, in the NHS. It's not that easy if I, as a patient, told my healthcare professionals, I want the data to have access to it and I want to give it to that researcher, is still, we go through loops of information, going up and so, trying to solve that. But, you know, we are getting there. We, have, we are nearly there. Having achieved this, we want to just measure what impact it has on the healthcare system. Some may argue, well, that is obvious. That is going to be good. We don't need any big study to answer the impact, to find out what impact that uh, intervention might have. And there are lots of examples in the literature, and this is uh, a, an example paper from John Cruishang, a, a, a consultant who writes about these things, and a few years ago he advised the NHS that they should be adopting um, home monitoring or telemonitoring today. And if you look at you know, what he quotes, he draws uh, his conclusion from uh, Veterans Health Affairs System, which is an integrated system in, in the US, where they have been using home monitoring for several years. And he provides examples for different conditions and for heart failure, saying, well, if, if the NHS starts implementing today, it could save 20 to 56 percent expenditure uh, for management of this condition. Obviously, huge motivation for any resource-constrained healthcare uh, system, uh, and people have started adopting it. But if you look at it as a scientist into where the data is coming from, at the end, you're unable to say whether that reduction is something that would have happened anyway, or is it really caused by someone using a home monitoring system? That is why we need you know, larger studies to, if you want to be certain, if you want to be reasonably certain that what we are doing to these patients covering that gap is doing more, harm, more benefit than harm. And this is what we are doing here. By connecting with the patients, we're getting sort of data from them we bring it to a system, we connect it with the health records and guidelines, so we have all the information together. This is digital health converged for analysis, and we can then filter and provide feedback to the patients directly and the healthcare professionals in an automated way, but personalized for those group of people that are at risk, and hope that by doing this, uh, we can transform the way healthcare is being delivered. So to just conclude, I mean, I think what we know is digital health has the potential for transforming healthcare. Uh, it is easy to demonstrate that we can collect a large amount of data from different sensors. Um, by doing this, we can extend the access to healthcare uh, professionals where no access is, a, uh, is available or limited access is available. Um, and we can make knowledge more accessible to end consumers. They can visualize, and a lot of them enjoy doing that. But what we don't know is whether that, what we have uh, achieved or what we can achieve, um, can actually do, uh, lead to better diagnosis and at the end to better health outcomes and resource utilization. And that is what requires a collaborative approach, large-scale approach, interdisciplinary approach to test uh, and is not something that uh, can be evaluated um, overnight. And I don't know if you, you know, walked in, you have seen probably James Martin's quote, um, we can make any world that we want. That is when I'm entering this building every day, I'm inspired by. Um, and I think as far as digital health is concerning, we can say that this scenario is probably not unlikely uh, in the future uh, for many people. And at the end, I just want to thank many of the people who are involved in this uh, work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kazem and Terry. Um, we've now got um, time for questions, discussions. Um, 
and we have a roving mic, so please just put your hand up and uh, the microphone will come to you magically. The front here. Oh, I should say this is being filmed and live webcast, so if you're uncomfortable with that, please don't put your hand up. Hi. Uh, thank you, both speakers. Those were excellent talks. Um, and you covered from zero to, well, what a end point, um, all-cause mortality. Um, I'm wondering, um, both, uh, both of you are looking at management. Uh, and, and, and you mentioned a little bit about intervention, earlier intervention, earlier and earlier intervention point that people are not necessarily interested. We talk about it, but we're not intervening, I mean, when it comes with pills and potions. Um, but what about, uh, you showed, um, I mean, this will summarize my question. The last picture that you showed of the uh, gymnast lady, you, you pointed out that this could be the world that we make. But if we were truly going to make a world where we're making regenerative medicine true, she wouldn't either, uh, neither would she have the white hair or the the wrinkled skin, because you would get the whole. You wouldn't just fix one organ, you would just go through, because any one organ doesn't fail, it's the whole collapse of the system. So my question is that, are we looking towards true regenerative medicine that would actually push back all cause, not just any one single? I mean, of course, you both talked about cardiovascular mortality, but, but the whole system. Sounds like such an interesting question. I think I'll let Kazim address it. <laughs> it, it, is, it is really interesting. I, I think it's a philosophical question. I mean, what, what is it that we want to achieve? I mean, we didn't talk about, uh, you know, regenerative medicine. Um, the assumption, I think, that Terry and I made in our presentations is that death is inevitable. What we want to uh, achieve is avoid premature death and what we want to achieve with our work is to make sure that we enjoy a good quality of life so that when we get to that age, you know, you have lived your life. I mean, there's lots of studies suggesting that there is a natural boundary um, to our aging. Um, and uh, the point that probably I didn't make any ex very explicit is many of the interventions that um, we have available today, they have been more successful in extending life than increasing the quality of life. So that is what we want to, you know, that a lot of researchers are focusing on, saying uh, perhaps we are reaching the point where the inevitable is reached in many societies or will be reached in many societies with the science, with biological science that we have. Uh, and we should probably focus on uh, um, making, um, you know, adding quality to the life of the people. Um, so there is, you know, obviously a whole area of regenerative medicine that, you know, is focusing on going beyond those um, accepted limits. Uh, but this is not at least a domain that uh, I work in. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting talks. Um, I have a question uh, separately for Professor Dwyer and Dr. Rahimi. Of Professor Dwyer, but my first question, I guess, is um, I thought there were already two studies linking childhood adiposity and cardiovascular disease endpoints, um, one based on small studies in Pima Indians, and one is a large study from Danish uh, school health records, and they've already linked adiposity with adverse uh, cardiovascular risk later in life. I just wonder whether you're, you are still planning to look at other uh, factors other than uh, adiposity. I guess that's my yes. question. The, if, if you want to get early life measures on individuals from historical records, the things that are most available are height and weight. So you, there are many studies that look at height and weight over time and through childhood, and not so much in this area, but if one wants to look at their uh, educational attainment and similar similar factors, it's easy to get that information. What we're interested in here, and I didn't go into the detail of the risk factors, is at least the major risk factors, the ones that uh, have been attributed with the highest increase in risk, so serum cholesterol, blood pressure, and smoking, in essence. And that's not so easy to get. Smoking smoking's not bad at all, because even recall of smoking is, is surprisingly very accurate. But things like serum cholesterol, 
and blood pressure along with the life, associated lifestyle factors, for example, and height, weight, all those things. Um, to get all that together is really very, uh, very difficult, uh, especially with any duration. There are lots of uh, child uh, birth cohort studies, child cohort studies that have started in the last 20 years. But to go back as much as 40 and 50 years and get that data is very difficult. And in the end, we really have only been able to find seven studies. We keep getting people raising stuff. Have you heard of this study? And we go and we look and we find, well, they actually don't have serum cholesterol or really their eldest, their eldest subjects are uh, 25 or something. Thank you. Um, for, for the question for Dr. Rahimi is, I've, um, I'm intrigued about the digital platform that you're going to use to, to, let's say, provide information to either the healthcare providers or the patients themselves. What's your vision about how to provide that information? Because I've always wondered, like, you know, if you say you put data or information on, let's say, guidelines, let's say, in a, on a tablet or whatever, there's so much details in guidelines. Um, do you have any vision on how to simplify that? Because pages, are, you know, even for medical doctors and healthcare professionals, to go through guidelines is, is a bit too much. And they change all the time. And they're also specific to certain regions in the world. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, there, there are two challenges in, 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 in uh, trying to present information um, to consumers. One is uh, the issue that you just uh, referred to. How can we aggregate uh, information about management of disease and diseases? Because you know, many people will have multiple diseases, and the recommendations may conflict. Um, how can we do that? Um, I mean, that, that's not easy, but uh, doable. I mean, that is something that is, in fact, you could argue com by having done it once and program it into a computer, you can get better output than asking individuals to go through multiple uh, guidelines uh, uh, and uh, trying to make sense of it. I think that is doable, and uh, our colleagues have done it for a number of conditions. The other aspects of it, once you have done it, um, how do you present it to the decision maker to facilitate decision making? Um, because we all know, whether we are healthcare professionals or, or not, the concept of um, understanding risk, absolute risk, relative risk, how it impacts um, our life over short term, over long term, is not something that we are good at. Um, and there are a number of studies that have shown that the decision that we make can vastly vary depending on which measure we actually present to the people. So it is a science on its own. I mean, we do our best. I mean, it's something that needs to be further developed. Um, and there are many people working in the area of shared decision making. That is the focus of the research only, um, how to present data in a way that leads to the best outcome so that people are informed. So do you reduce the avoidable ignorance uh, that people are facing? Hi, Kasem. Um, you say death's inevitable, and it isn't it inevitable that telehealth will be? Because we all want it, because patients want it. Um, you, you know I'm, my family's a high user of the health service, and it frustrates me immensely when I can't get that information to my A&E consultant when I visit A&E, which I do on a regular occasion. Um, so because we want it as a big, large patient group, and this has been shown with how many hundreds of millions of users want, use Facebook, et cetera, therefore it will be inevitable. Uh, I agree, I mean, that that's the future picture that are, that are portrayed. Um, there are many systems that are using it already, a different level of um, sophistication and different level of evaluation. But, you know, healthcare is quite a um, unique market uh, if you compare it with other sectors of the economy, you as a consumer, Damien, if you like uh, your telehealth for your family, uh, or if you like an iPhone, you just go, because you like the, the look of it, you just go to the next shop and buy it. In healthcare, the, 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 the challenge is that the, those who may benefit from a technology are not necessarily those who would buy, uh, pay for it, and not, they are not necessarily those who use that technology. So it's a separation of the different components of the market. Um, so to convince the NHS to pay that for you requires a different set of um, studies and, and evaluation. To integrate it in a way that healthcare professionals' behavior can be incorporated into that is a different thing. As individuals, you, you, have, you, can have, you have your choices. Um, but it is a complex system 
into which we are talking to bring digital health into. We, we're talking about disrupting the, you know, the hospital-based model, but something that is you know, virtual. Uh, and that will take some time. Um, I just, uh, uh, yesterday there was a talk about um, here, about care, uh, not, not um, chronic disease care per se, but it was, um, it seemed like a quite a different one. It was about caring for people on the ground in context, looking at particulars of the person, understanding the person. And, um, and today looks more about um, systems and, and understanding risk and all. And, and it seems like these both perspectives are important for care, but it um, seems to me they're both going off in different directions, very much so. And I'm just wondering whether you, how, how much both you see it as, whether that's the case or you see them being integrated well. So kind of what happens contextually on the ground with real people, as, as people, um, compared to people with systems. And I acknowledge you had, you were look, talking about ethnography there, but it, it looked like it was premised on people again as kind of um, systems and, well, like with language of feedback and yes. calculating risks and things like that. I'm not sure who should, should attack that, but as I haven't addressed the, the last couple of questions. Um, I, there are elements of your question that I really didn't quite comprehend, but I think if you're asking whether our two approaches, the treatment approaches, particularly dealing with people who are very sick, and the prevention approaches are different, of course, of course they are, and they, they need different skills and different evidence. In terms of the way we treat those two ends of a, a spectrum of, of dealing with disease, as a society we've generally done much better certainly in the last century with treatment than prevention. Um, I haven't seen recent estimates, but the um, a standard estimate ha of how much we spend on prevention as a percentage of the whole healthcare budget, it's, it's of the order of 1%. Now, um, a lot of these things are how you define your terms and you could come up with a different figure, but it's a very small amount that's spent on, spent on prevention. And I think there are a couple of reasons for it. From a doctor's standpoint, the doctor's skills are more special in terms of treating disease. I went through medical school, treated patients in hospitals and outside, and the reason I ended, mainly, ended up mainly in prevention was that I actually didn't like to see people suffering who I thought probably didn't need to. If we just knew a little bit more, they wouldn't have to go through, through, uh, through that, uh, that intervention. And, uh, but on the other hand, once people have become sick, you want to do something for them. My own view is we should be spending slightly more on um, preventing disease for a whole host of reasons, in, including that my guess is some of the things that I'm talking about there, changes in lifestyle, which put back the time at which atherosclerosis has advanced, would also improve quality of life. You know, things that are measurable, like can a person walk up a hill? Uh, do they have the, the energy to go and take themselves somewhere to do? Those sort of things that make life good uh, are affected by some basic um, disease processes that many of which can be prevented or at least delayed for a longer period than we normally see today. So in terms of, that may not answer your question, but maybe because oh. maybe because M can come, come in here. Did, did it answer your question? Or is there anything left? Uh, of I, I suppose that the epidemiology risk factors, it's kind of like, um, I think social scientists kind of describe as a governing from afar. So it's um, trying to help a lot of people all at once and then you get this kind of on the ground, person to person, and that really for people, oh, if it's like around chronic disease, people need to connect and understand each other. Um, but it seems like to be a different process. It's more qualitative. It's not about um, technical details or predicting things. It's well, just understanding a person as a person. As oh, so, so you're talking about the different approaches in research trying to tackle essentially the same yeah, problem. Yeah, they're, they're kind of different approaches, but so they need to come together at some point, surely, if it's about chronic disease prevention and care and, and people's well-being beyond risk and whether they have a disease or not. And yeah. I I mean, I'm not familiar with those concepts. I mean, there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, ideas and methods of um, assessing things. And uh, as, as you just said at the beginning of your question, you know, Terry and I are in the 
quantitative uh, aspect of uh, assessing it, whilst understanding that uh, uh, borrowing methodologies from other disciplines is incredibly important. Uh, but if you like, the backbone of many of our work is um, data. Um, and uh, by being part of the Oxford Martin School, we tap into other type of methodologies that we don't have or don't understand. So I wouldn't be specifically comment on that you know, social model that, that you're describing where um, the interaction between people might be you know, more, if I understood you correctly, and might play a great role in uh, uh, understanding and, and controlling chronic disease. Um, but what we are looking at is our, um, at the individual level, what are the things that the biological determinants of ill health, what are the proven interventions um, that today uh, can tackle those um, diseases or reduce the, the risk of disease occurring, um, and then finally, don't, that knowledge that we have, can, how can we get it into practice? Um, new concepts uh, are likely to emerge, um, showing us alternative ways of looking at the problem, um, and you know, we need to watch the space and learn from those methodologies. Um, I was just going to say, the s seminar that the gentleman was talking about was the Oxford Institute of Population Aging's Ethics of Care. All right, okay, thanks. Hi, um, thank you both for a very stimulating talk. I have two questions, one for Dr. Rahimi and one for Dr. Dwyer. The one for Dr. Rahimi is relatively quick, so I guess I'll ask it first. Just out of curiosity, uh, in your data that you presented, there was a patient at age 21 who had heart failure. What was the etiology of that? Uh, th that's a simple question. Uh, so, you know, heart failure is a condition that uh, some people is an can be inherited. So that is inherited cardiomyopathy that affects the oh, young okay. person. Okay. Um, and uh, my question for Dr. Dwyer is, um, uh, I, was, I was curious um, about the data that you presented on the study about childhood obesity mm -hmm. and about the conclusion that um, it is really the, the um, adult obesity that contributes to increasing cardiovascular risk. Um, now, I'm just curious, um, not, not to be the devil's advocate, but doesn't that kind of imply that childhood obesity isn't that important when it comes to cardiovascular risk? And I was just wondering what your thoughts are about why childhood obesity is still very much important and just like, for example, how, how prevalent it is um, and what in, in your mind is the best way to address this issue in the absence of uh, um, sound randomized controlled trials and other data? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I wouldn't conclude that that's the final answer. We, you know, we've looked at certain outcomes and it doesn't, there was a bit of a benefit there in uh, being lean at both stages, stages compared to being obese in both points. One of the, one of the um, things we said to the reviewers and the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, because they first said, well, it's very interesting, but it shows that this is not, not important. And our response was, well, the only thing you have to look at here is that only 10% of those children who were obese it normalised their weight in adulthood. So childhood obesity is, has both biological effects and it's all, also part of a social behavioural process. And it seems as though it's very difficult once people become very overweight as children to get them back on the right track. If it happens, maybe it eliminates all the risk. I'd wait until there's more, more data in on that. That's the, best, that's the best summary of what I showed you and that's what I said, but I'd still wait. Um, I think the other thing other thing is this, that there is this process of once someone becomes overweight, while they can reverse it, most don't. Most find it very difficult and they find it difficult for a whole host of, whole host of reasons. They're used to doing what they do. Uh, exercise becomes more difficult so that becomes less of their life because it's unpleasant rather than pleasant. Uh, the food habits that they've adopted, they find easy to maintain, they tend to like those foods. So all the things that go into making a child obese are, are likely to uh, encourage the continuation of the condition to a very high extent, very high extent. So uh, e even if it, the biological uh, argument or, or evidence I've put out turns out to be sustained through everything we look at, there's still this behavioural issue that would uh, provide the basis for saying, well, don't let 
an individual become overweight in the first place and through childhood? Do, there's a question at the front there. So my question kind of covered quickly between both of your uh, topics. So um, really you were saying about how your, your study was retrospective, right? Sorry, I'm, I'm prospective. prospective. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't go through all the methods, aspects in detail. It would okay. have been boring and it would have taken a lot longer. <laughs> um, well, uh, you said how difficult it would be to set up like a randomized control trial or something like that. Mm -hmm. But do you think it would be much easier to have prospective studies with huge populations in the advent of a new kind of medical revolution in big data to so say everyone had their medical records made into electronic copies you could ask them whether that you were able to enroll them in a trial and then you'd be able to instead of having 40,000 have a few hundred thousand people or the whole population of the NHS for example enrolled in such a trial. So what, what the options are within what you've said are that you could rely on the routinely collected records. Probably what you'd find is the things we need for this study weren't either weren't available on a sufficient proportion of the population for us to be able to have access to a large fraction to include in trials. And there's also the standardisation. Uh, if one of the nice things about what we're doing is that the way in which cholesterol was measured had standardised aspects and blood pressure and so on. So it wouldn't, it, the data may not be as good data if we did it that way, but I wouldn't write off it being um, very useful if we had data on everyone. Uh, of course, there, there are some issues in terms of whether people would want to provide that data and whether once they started to, whether there might be a reaction from the community. But it, such data would be valuable and we're, we're trying to access here whatever routinely collected health records there are that de-identified are available for analysis to address some of these questions as well as the specifically designed studies. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, I'd just like to draw your attention to some upcoming events before we thank the speakers again. Um, this, we have three more um, events in this series of health in the 21st century. Um, next Thursday at 3.30, we are looking at the progress and challenges in the next 10 years of eradicating hepatitis C and HIV. The week after, we're on why do we need to reconstruct drug discovery. And the last is on strategies for vaccines for the 21st century. And just um, one other event to draw your attention to. Um, next Tuesday um, at 5 o'clock um, for one hour, we have a panel um, addressing a question which is quite important if Terry and Gazem get their way. Is the planet full? Um, it may be. Um, if we can. And um, we have experts um, from various Oxford Martin programs um, talking from different angles on that question. One on the future of food, on population aging, tropical forests, and on ethics. Um, so that's a one hour event uh, followed by a drinks reception to which you're all very welcome. And now it just remains for us, I think, to thank our speakers one last time. Thank you.